Hello everybody and welcome to Project Dogbone. This is a reveal video, one of many, hopefully. My name is Bob Greenier. I am a volunteer for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project at quantumheat.org. The purpose of this video is to try and understand Rossi's and industrial heat strategy. And we're asking the question, what is the cat's first home? Earlier this year in southern Switzerland, in a town called Lugano, a 32-day test was conducted on a reactor supplied by industrial heat to scientists from Bologna University and Uppsala University uh, and it was sponsored by various Swedish bodies like Elforsk and uh, Swedish Technical Institute. The findings of that report can be seen, if you haven't read them already, um, in a PDF that is published at the link given on this slide. Essentially, the paper uh, reveals a excess heat generation from the device over the 32-day period of 1.5 megawatts and isotopic shifts of lithium from 7 to 6 uh, and all of the nickel isotopes from naturally occurring isotopes um, towards uh, nickel 62, uh, amongst other things. So here is a closer look at the reactor and uh, the scientists scraped away some of the external casting and did some analysis and came back that it was made of alumina, aluminium oxide, and that kind of suggested to uh, members of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project that this was sitting um, in you know, the kind of field of uh, furnace uh, elements and you know that that made sense really to us. So we started investigating how we might um, you know, reach these kind of temperatures and, and so forth. And uh, it turned out that there was a, um, you know, a conference coming up where uh, they were discussing uh, you know, heat treatment. So here we see a furnace heating element. It's a single core. And it's not unlike uh, something you might imagine would be inside the Lugano reactor. So with uh, some kind donations uh, from the public, I um, took myself to Cologne, and the morning of which I woke up, it was quite misty, uh, to witness a cold march. Going up the uh, Rhine, quite poetic, really. Or well, just behind that, there was a gas barge. You can see the uh, coal barge in the distance on the left. So uh, you couldn't get really more poetic. Uh, having finished my coffee, I took myself to the exhibition centre to the heat treatment. Moving around the show hall, you see a wide range of furnace heating element suppliers and it kind of, you know, things started to look familiar. Uh, some very excellent pieces of industry going on. A whole other world out there. People making the kind of products that, uh, you know, make our dental teeth and, you know, car parts and you name it. You've probably used something in the last few days that needed heat treatment. Well, anyway, walking around the exhibition hall, I stumbled upon this. Okay, so what is it, you might be asking? 
it's basically um, something I'd seen before. I wasn't quite sure where, but um, definitely related to uh, industrial heat Rossi. So I thought, could it be? Well, yeah, okay, so I went back to uh, ECAT World. Uh, this is an amazing resource. Um, it's an online website ran by Frank uh, Ackland, who's been uh, tireless in um, researching this field. And uh, these images came from the link given at the bit.ly link at the bottom there. But they look remarkably like the housings that I showed you in this previous slide here. Okay, uh, only they're filled. So, could it be <laughs> that the purpose of these hot cats is for, you know, furnace heating elements? Well, let's look at a heating element that a manufacturer would make there. Here's a cutaway of a heating element. A resistive heating element and you can see okay could that like that bit in the middle be replaced by a much bigger version of the Lugano reactor I think it might looking at here are two furnace heater elements well actually they're just the housings for them so is what we've seen in this experiment just the hot core for a industrial furnace? Okay, so these um, casings come in all shapes and sizes and this one here is produced uh, about a 15 minute tram ride away from where I'm sitting right now in the Czech Republic so hopefully I'll get a chance to go up and visit that foundry and get a real understanding for the man manufacture of these items. So, okay, so if the hot cat in the Lugano test was, uh, you know, meant to be a replacement for the core of an uh, electric heating element, that made me think, what about gas hot cat? I mean, there was a lot of talk about Rossi um, having a, a, a gas cat or a partly assisted gas hot cat. Um, so wandering around the exhibition hall I came across this. And uh, you might be asking yourself, uh, is this from some sort of first person shooter? I don't know, but it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, I thought, hello, uh, that looks familiar too. I'm pretty sure I've seen something similar to that also on ECAT World. So let me take you to the next slide here. What's that in Rossi's hand? Could that be something like this? I don't know, I just love this photo. He's very, uh, you know, engaged in his work. And uh, if you imagine the reactor there on the right, uh, with gas blowing through that to assist the heating of it and the resistive elements to help uh, control the uh, maybe magnetic pulses, who knows, um, but the uh, help control or stimulate the Lenner reaction. Um, this in theory would, um, you know, assist the gas heating and, and, and reduce the cost um, of, uh, you know, supplying energy to that heater element. Go ahead, so you're, this, this is a, a gas heating element. And what are, what are all the pipes? Self-recuperative boiler, the complete one. Okay, okay. Self-recuperative yeah. boiler. So this part is a gas head mm -hmm. with two connections for the main gas and also for flux gas. That means flameless oxidation. Mm -hmm. so, installation of two electrodes, one ignition electrode and one uh, flame monitoring, deionization. Yeah. Here you have the uh, combustion air head, it's a combustion air valve, you have three possibilities to connect the combustion air here, or you, you can draw it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So, this is the head for the flue gas. Yeah, the flue gas connection, combustion air connection, gas connection. And so what temperature would this operate up to? Therefore, uh, silicon carbide, the maximum uh, flue gas temperature, 1,300 degrees centigrade. Yeah, for the casting metallic design, 1,050. 1,050 1,050. Okay. Yeah. So the silicon carbide's 1,300 degrees. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all I need to know. So 1,300 degrees and the Lugano test was reporting temperatures of up to sort of 1,400 thereabouts, 1,410. So would this be like a replacement element? I mean, you know, gas is getting up to that 1,300 degrees. Well, you, you wouldn't even need gas in this if you could have a resistive element that got up to um, 1,300 degrees. Uh, and one would imagine it's it's simpler uh, than all of those complex controllers and and pipes and flues etc uh, required to you know control this uh, heating element but you'd probably still want the silicon carbide um, exterior so, so what kind of things do these go into uh, to give you a feel of the kind of things that this might go into um, here is a very large vacuum furnace so this is from a Japanese company and you know this is serious engineering I mean imagine that inside there running at sort of 1400 degrees it's quite scary um, but this is the kind of thing that's necessary to create some of the modern wonders we all uh, use so is the reactor designed to fit in something like this? Here, what temperature would this operate to? 1,150. 1,150. Yeah. One here is a uh, silicon carbide. So you can see carbide. see the element there. Yeah. And uh, this is for going to 1,300 degrees. Looking at here is some so, silicon uh, carbide gas. Uh, heater Heating elements. elements. Um, Around. Probably for gas. I think they would make really in this awesome case, but heaters for the house. They just look like they're out of a, you know, a, a movie or some sort of game. So back to the reactor itself. Um, got me thinking. Let's assume this is uh, a kind of furnace heater element, what can we see in the shape of the uh, Lugano reactor that might correlate with uh, a heating element? And I was always struck by the very wavy line of the central cylinder and it just looked a little bit sloppy initially but um, as I was handling this uh, resistive heater element here, you see in the top of the slide I noticed that if you look at it from an angle, you see these wavy lines too, and it's it's just the way the spring hangs, having been formed around the cylinder. And if you imagine that you then tried to cast or or scrape or form some uh, alumina paste uh, around that, it would you know likely take on a similar kind of shape uh, to what you're seeing in the actual reactor. So it kind of implied that it's way simpler than, you know, you might first think. So I'm here with Dirk and uh, this is a heater element here. Uh, it's a single helix for, you know, single phase. And uh, it's on a, it's a, an alumina cylinder, yeah. alumina, aluminium oxide cylinder. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. And there's a little hole through the middle there, as you can see, if we can see daylight through there. Okay, uh, so this is kind of thing, but um, it's going to need to be a triple helix. So uh, these are my conclusions. Uh, I will say that uh, these are my conclusions. Um, a little bit of conjecture, potentially, but um, 
I'm pretty confident that this might be what's going on. So essentially, industrial heater starting in the furnace element business. Uh, excellent, excellent place to start. Really good choice. Um, why? Because, well, there's no real need to generate energy. Um, and because of that, they can focus on improving the heat generation tech of the technology uh, in an industry that's just going to like um, you know, that happening. Uh, you have to understand that in the heat treatment business, once you've bought your furnace and, you know, other than the periodic changing of elements, um, a very large proportion of the costs, the recurring costs, is energy, um, be that gas or electricity. And as I showed earlier, it's a much more complex thing to have a, uh, a gas element. Uh, you first have to pipe in the gas, and uh, then you have to, you know, have all that sort of uh, gas management and and uh, flue gases um, management on the actual heating element. Whereas a resistive element um, is, you know, electricity in. So big advantages uh, by simplifying it, um, if that's what's happening. I mean, the real big things, um, you know, down the bottom there is that any savings uh, in uh, not needing to use so much gas or electricity um, will reduce the need for hydrocarbons. And any, you know, reduction in those things will give direct savings to um, members, in, you know, who operate in the heat treatment industry uh, who take on board this technology. And that really fits for me with Tom Darden of Industrial Heat talking about, you know, the two things that were important to the customer. Uh, one was to save money and two was to reduce carbon footprint. You know, maybe one day this technology will um, uh, not um, require large barges of coal and gas to be taken up the Rhine to feed German industry. So thank you for listening and, uh, you know, check out the site and our Facebook page and uh, we look forward to uh, sharing this journey with you.